at various times uh, during the, certainly the last year of the administration. You have folks in the White House who are proposing to take military action against Venezuela, uh, to, to, to strike Iran. At one point, somebody proposed we blockade Cuba. These ideas would happen, uh, it seemed, every, every few weeks, something like this would come up, and we'd have to swat them down. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Today's guest is former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper. His new book, A Sacred Oath, has been making headlines the last few weeks with revelations about what happened inside the Trump White House. Secretary Esper has described how former President Trump and other staff proposed shooting Black Lives Matter protesters bombing drug cartels in Mexico and taking military action against other nations. A lot to unpack in this book. Secretary Esper, thank you for joining us. Thanks, David. It's great to be with you. So uh, congratulations on the, on the book. Uh, you've been asked every question under the sun, I think, these last couple of weeks. I'm going to try to ask you a few new ones. Um, and I want to start with uh, what's on our minds uh, in part this week, which is uh, political elections around the country. Uh, y y Trump endorsed candidates did well in some of these uh, primary races. You wrote in your book about Trump, and I'm going to quote a very direct passage. He is an, an unprincipled person who, given his self-interest, should not be in the position of public service. So I wanted to ask you what you would tell voters in this election run-up to the midterms and then to, to 2024 about Donald Trump and, and whether he is fit for further office? Yeah, thanks, David. It's a, it's a great question, right? And I'd say if you want to talk about the endorsements he made and the so-called wins he had, but look, I at the end of the day, my message would be to my fellow Republicans, and I consider myself a Reagan Republican, and I would say this much. For me, uh, I, I think there's a new cadre of Republicans out there who can run in 2024, but they're going to have to meet a few marks. First of all, they're going to have to put country over self. Uh, secondly, they're going to have to lead with integrity and have core principles that guide them. And then third, they got to be able to reach across the aisle and, uh, and, and help bring the country together. And fourth, for the party itself, you've got to be able to grow the base. And look, President Trump was, is unable to meet the marks for any of those things for me. And I would tell Republicans that this new cadre of leaders can advance all those same core Republican policies that Trump did, right? A lower taxes, less regulation, smaller government, conservative judges, rebuilding the military, border security. Uh, we have people that will do those things and make progress just like Trump did, but without the coarseness and divisiveness and all those other things that are tearing our country apart right now. That's my message. So it's a powerful message. I have to ask you, uh, you said it with conviction, would you consider running for president yourself in 2024? <laughs> I, I couldn't win a primary, David. Uh, un unfortunately, Reagan Republicans and Republicans like myself are finding themselves on the short end of primaries. And it's the same. The same is happening, by the way, on the Democrat side. The progressives are the far left is leading. And it's the problem with our uh, with our system today is we can't get the folks, the, the reasonable folks, the moderates, whatever you want to describe them, uh, from the center of the uh, of the country, folks who I think represent most Americans, to run, let alone win, in such a primary. So that's that's the challenge our nation faces right now. And I, I want to ask you whether you've gotten responses from moderate Republicans like yourself, uh, Reagan Republicans, if you will, who, who've read your book or, or seen the television coverage of it, and and have said, "Good for you. Uh, that this is what we need more of." Are you getting that kind of feedback? I have. I'm getting a lot of feedback. And of course, you get it from, from family and friends, but uh, they don't really count. Uh, but yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of folks who I don't know, others who will come up to me and, and say, thank you for writing the book. I, you know, I, I value what you say. I, again, I think there's this large, silent majority, so to speak, out there on both sides of the aisle that want to see uh, want to see leaders who will bring the country together, who can who can lead uh, through bipartisanship. You know, I, I, again, I call myself a Reagan Republican. Reagan famously reached across the aisle to House Speaker Tip O'Neill and, and made agreement after agreement on stuff. And, uh, you know, he never compromised his, his values, but he was, he was one to take 80 uh, percent when many others in the party were arguing for 80 for 100 percent. And that's the kind of approach to politics and policymaking that we need to get back to. 
President Biden speaks of a desire to do what you just described, reach across the aisle, govern for, for the whole country. You can argue about how successful he's been, but certainly on an issue like the war in Ukraine, he's seeking a, a bipartisan uh, approach. Would you consider uh, appearing with President Biden to speak together in support of policies that you both believe in? I'll speak with any American or alongside any American who wants to speak to these uh, to these issues, to these matters. Absolutely. Look, I, I do think he's trying or initially tried to lead. I, I think what he did on the infrastructure bill in terms of uh, reaching out to Republicans and pushing back on progressives to, to to not try and ram a bill through Congress was the right thing to do. And and uh, because I think that's his instinct. You know, I, I worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee 20 years ago when he was when he was leading it. And uh, so I, I think I know where his instincts are, but he's being pulled uh, further left than I think he'd want to go either. Uh, so he's facing that own challenge within his party. But look, I think we need more people to stand up and talk about these issues and lead from uh, lead from a position that, that you can reach across the aisle and work with with others. I, look, I'm a big fan of Joe Manchin, for example. I think uh, Joe Manchin uh, has done a lot of good work for not just the country, but for his own caucus as well. Let me turn back to, to Donald Trump uh, for a moment and just ask, if he were elected president again in 2024, what kind of defense and foreign policies do you think he would pursue? For example, an obvious question is whether he would seek some kind of rapprochement with Russia and China, regardless of the current security situation. And also, frankly, what dangers do you think he would pose if he were reelected? I think first and foremost, he's not going to uh, um, make the same mistake with regard to personnel as he did uh, in his first term, right? He's going to pick real loyalists and put them into these key jobs. Uh, obviously, that was my concern during the last six, seven months of my tenures. If I left or if I was fired too soon, who he would put in. So he's going to not make that mistake twice, number one. Number two, from a national security perspective, uh, look, I'm very concerned that he would try with, to withdraw from NATO to uh, reposition our forces off the Korean Peninsula, maybe make withdrawals from Japan. Uh, so there's that side of the coin. But the other side is, you know, would he push tough policies uh, with regard to communist China and Russia by, uh, as well? I'm not sure. You know, I talk about this in the book. On one hand, I think the Trump administration deserves credit for uh, forming a consensus in the country about China being our strategic adversary. And with that, uh, the departments marched forward on a series of plans. For me, it was implementing the national defense strategy that identified China as our, our threat, pacing threat, and then from there, modernizing the force. But President Trump really never got on board with his own policy, uh, at least not until the end, right, when COVID uh, hit the country hard and he had every reason to accuse China of, of being the source of it. Uh, but he, he was more inclined to talk about trade matters and to describe constantly Xi Jinping as his close friend. And when you're trying to take a tough approach and show resolve and determination, in some ways that undermines your foreign policy. A, a puzzle for me, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, knowing you a bit uh, as somebody who covers the Pentagon, was uh, why as these things that you describe so vividly in your book were happening, um, you didn't speak out more. People have asked you this this question, and and uh, I've, I've heard the answers. But there is a feeling that I have is a little bit like somebody who watches a car wreck happening and doesn't report it to the to the police. Uh, why didn't you take action more when were, there were such threatening things happening? Well, the difference between your metaphor and I would say it's not watching a car wreck. I was in the car wreck. I was behind the wheel of a car, a very important car. Uh, I was the only person other than the president of the United States that can deploy troops. And I felt at the end of the day, um, and this question has been asked a lot, that I was better off serving my country in office, able to do two things. One, advance important agendas, initiatives in the, in the DOD, you know, building our cyber capabilities, proposing a new Navy, modernizing the force, taking care of our soldiers and families. I could, I could pursue a positive agenda there, but meanwhile, be in position to push back on bad ideas or to swat away outlandish ones. And my concern was if I wasn't, I was quite confident that he would put in a loyalist, a loyalist and a team of loyalists who would pursue all these bad ideas. And look, if you don't like what happened after I was fired uh, in December uh, with the Pentagon, you weren't going to like it for eight months. And that was my concern. And I wrestled with this, David. I talk about it a lot in the first 
10 pages of my book, I went so far as to consult predecessors from both parties, Colin Powell, who'd become a mentor of mine, to a person said, you got to stay, you got to do it. So uh, I wasn't watching the car wreck. I was in the car wreck uh, behind, the, behind the wheel, or at least one of the wheels of the car, and trying to steer away from all these bad things. And again, at the end of the day, I thought my oath to the Constitution overrode what would have been, um, you, you know, for me, a personal decision, a lot easier, would have saved me a lot of grief, a lot of heartache, a lot of sleepless nights to just walk away. But I just didn't think that was the right thing to do. And that's, and frankly, I feel be- I feel more confident about that decision today than I did, you know, at the time, to be honest with you. This is a, f- a follow-up question is, is why uh, you went to work for Trump in the first place. A lot of what I'd call Reagan Republicans, people with strong national security credentials, looked at Trump, looked at his record, and said, uh-uh, can't do it, and, and, and backed away from national security positions. You, you didn't. Why did you go ahead when you knew that there were misgivings among people who were respected in your party? Yeah, no, you're right. And look, I respect their decisions. I think that's a, a credible position to take, and I write about this as well in the, in the opening of my book. Uh, Look, I've been serving the country since the age of 18. I, I swore my first oath at West Point in July 1982. I, it's just kind of in me to serve. And I figure if your nation calls, if the president calls, uh, you have a duty to serve or at least a really compelling reason not to. And for me uh, to become secretary of the Army, which was what I was uh, first nominated for in, in 2017, it was a, a double opportunity for me not just to serve my country again, but to but to bring uh, you know 21 years of, of military service, active duty, Guard and Reserve, War and Peace in the United States and abroad, all that to bear to uh, modernize the Army, take care of our families, do all those things that I could advance a very positive agenda. And if I might say, we got a lot done. I was blessed with a tremendous leadership team and uh, that were able to advance a lot of important things, uh, drive what I called the renaissance in the Army, and we made a lot of great progress. It's paying off now. So uh, look, I, I have no regrets about serving my country. Let me ask you about a, a, a paradox that, again, I thought about as these events were unfolding and, and I wanted to ask you about. A lot of the things that you uh, describe in your book are things that Trump might have done. Like he wanted to shoot protesters in the leg uh, in Lafayette Square. He wanted to fire missiles at the drug cartels. He wanted to pull troops out of Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, precipitously. But the interesting thing is that he didn't do them. Um, he was commander in chief. He had the power to do these things, but he didn't He didn't do them. For example, when he, w- he was being urged to take retaliatory action against Iran after the shoot down of our drone uh, in, in, the, in the Persian Gulf, he decided at the 11th hour not to take that action. So there's a bit of a puzzle for me as to why he talked so tough initially, but often pulled back and didn't execute. Can you help us understand that paradox? Sure. And I, I speak about all those things in my book and how I was trying to figure it out, particularly the Iran shootdown example. That was kind of my first revelation about him as a chief executive. And you're right. He likes to uh, uh, he likes to promote this notion of himself as a strong leader, decisive uh, you know, taking bold action. And look, he had his moments where he took bold action. I don't take that away from him. But in so many cases, he was unwilling to give the order or to give an order. And, uh, you know, I received so few of them. Fortunately, that gave me the room to kind of make decisions that I thought were best for DOD or or for the country writ large, such as withdrawing from NATO. And so it was, it was that kind of uh, lack or, or unwillingness to make those tough decisions that that allowed allowed us to, uh, to 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 do what we thought was best in the absence of guidance. And uh, you know his, his techniques seemed to be that he would suggest or muse or throw it out in the air and hope somebody would latch on to these ideas and run with them. And too often, at least in the as I described in my book, the June first thing, uh, Attorney General Barr, uh, Mark Milley, and myself pushed back on this idea of bringing uh, uh, troops into the city, uh, active duty, and then shooting protesters. But my concern was always that it was the people around him in the White House, the, these uber loyalists, who would pick up these ideas and run with them. And that's what concerned me, particularly, again, as I, I weighed this notion about should I, should I walk away, should I resign, should I speak out immediately and get fired, uh, what's the best thing to do, and who would come in behind me? And these are big ethical considerations. I, I, frankly, I hope people will think about and consider 
because we may face these things again in the future from either party. One of the interesting revelations for me in your book, uh, Mr. Secretary, was about our uh, cybercom commander uh, and the head of the National Security Agency, General Paul Nakasone, uh, someone who's widely respected, but who had enemies in the Trump White House among some of these uber loyalists that you describe. And you write about how there was a, a strong effort to get Nakasone fired. Uh, in uh, January 2020, uh, late uh, uh, 2019, in in part because of, of concerns that General Nakasone was providing too much in, in intelligence information to his oversight committee, uh, the House Intelligence Committee, headed by Representative Adam Schiff, who, who the Trump loyalists didn't like, and that they were pushing and pushing to, to get him uh, sacked. Uh, you write uh, later that your own defense of Nakasone uh, in October 2020, uh, when there was again an effort to, to push him out, may have been one of the reasons you finally got fired. But tell us about this 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 battle over General Nakasone, because his position is one of the most sensitive in the government, and by most accounts, certainly during the Ukraine uh, war period, his performance has been outstanding. So tell tell us about the effort to to get rid of him back in 2020. Sure. And, and look, he's just one person. I, there are others as well that were that were being pursued. And I, I mentioned a couple others, I think, in the book. But uh, General Paul Nakasone, Army officer, head of Cyber Command, an outstanding officer in so many ways, and has done uh, tremendous things to advance our cyber capabilities and was instrumental to making sure that there was no Russian interference or other interference in our 2018 elections. But yes, there was this, uh, this uh, drumbeat that picked up, I think, in late 2019, uh, where folks are concerned that he's sending information to the House Intelligence Committee run by Adam Schiff, a Democrat, uh, that was being used to, uh, uh, would be used against President Trump in the impeachment proceedings. And uh, it was getting to the point where uh, Nakasone was being squeezed by all sides and uh, came to myself and General Milley for guidance. And, uh, you know, I talk about this in the book, telling him to do the right thing and provide what he needed. But I had to go walk over to the White House uh, myself and have this private meeting with uh, the NSC and their lawyers to say, look, we're, you, we cannot put Nakasone in this position. You can't put the military officer in a bad position. It, it compromises him, the the institution and so on, and told them that they had to make a decision and civilians need to carry this 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 message, not Nakasone. And uh, we made it through that uh, th through that moment. And it was just another example of folks uh, wanting to fire good people. And it picks up, of course, as I described in the book, once the president beats impeachment. He brings in these fresh troops. That includes Mark Meadows and Rick Grinnell and Johnny McEntee, the head of personnel, president personnel, who who brings his own core of people in and and staffs them out to the departments to start doing these loyalty checks as we uh, get deeper and deeper into 2020. So you can see the context of all this stuff matters as we roll into uh, the summer of 2020. Uh General Nakasone is such an unusual figure that I, I, I want to ask you, if, if President Trump and these uber loyalists in the White House had succeeded in firing him, he certainly had the authority to do that, would you have quit then? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'd have to measure the circumstance at the time and, and ask myself, is it better to kind of follow my sword right here over Nakasone? And you're right, the president has the clear prerogative to do that. Um, or am I, again, better positioned to pre prevent other things from happening? You know, in some ways, I, I guess I made that decision when I decided to, uh, that I was going to defend Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, put him on the promotion list and send him to the War College. And uh, I was prepared to be fired then because I thought it was the right thing to do in terms of protecting the integrity of the military promotion system and, uh, and, and assignment system. So um, I, I don't know, probably. I certainly was willing to do it uh, and prepared that it would happen when it came to Vindman. In fact, as I describe in the book, once I tell the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, that I'd already put Vindman on the promotion list and it was coming over to the White House, I get a call later that night from him. And I thought that was just kind of the message for me to pack up my bags and go home. And look, I was fine with that. I thought it was a good thing to get fired over. I want to ask you a, a kind of devil's advocate uh, question. Um, you've been widely praised. Um, in talking about your book, for the uh, restraints that you and General Milley tried to p place uh, in the 
weeks, uh, months before the election, you write about the four no's that, that you wanted to make sure there were no strategic retreats, no unnecessary wars, no politicization of the military, and no misuse of the military. And that sounds appropriate and, and people uh, understandably have, have lauded that. But if you uh, think about that in a different way and imagine that we'd had a pro-Trump military, uh, very conservative military, uh, with a four nose policy trying to limit the uh, maneuver of, say, President Biden, a lot of people would say that's inappropriate. That looks like a, a, a military coup. That shouldn't happen. So I want to ask you, this is one of the toughest questions I think there is in this in this whole period, uh, about how you go about drawing the line. President Trump was elected. You weren't. Right. Uh, and and you and General Milley uh, uh, tried to serve the nation as best you could, but sometimes that meant, in effect, uh, ring fencing the orders of the, of the person who was elected. It's a good question. I talk about this a lot in the book. Um, look, it's the reason behind why I named the book a sacred oath. And uh, and so let me unpack it a little bit. Uh, first of all, I my oath was to the Constitution, uh, not to the president, not to the party, not to a philosophy. So. To me, that that became, as it should be for all elected officials and appointed officials, your your kind of guidestone. And so, as I went through my job, I wrestled with this too because at times I knew that if he gave me a direct order, the conundrum would be that the Constitution also has, you know, this Article Two that says there is a president and he is the chief executive officer and the commander in chief. And so, as I said earlier, David, I was fortunate to never get a direct order uh, because, I, look, I wasn't going to disobey a direct order from the president. If he gave it to me and I disagreed with it, I'd resign. It's, it's that simple. Uh, the one direct order I got was the withdrawal of uh, troops from Germany, and we can talk about that if you want. But let's go to your next point in terms of the lines you're, you're drawing. Look, we, we all draw lines. I, at least I did. I told very clearly to the Congress, the Senate, when I was uh, underwent my uh, nomination hearing, that I would never do anything illegal, immoral, or unethical. And I was very clear about that. And I was asked, would you consider resigning if, if, if you did? And I said, absolutely. I've said that throughout my career, frankly. But the four no's came about. I think, you know, Millie and I had always, at least I'll speak for myself, those four no's were there for me all along. It just became that after, uh, after June 1st and what happened in the succeeding days, that I came to draw them a lot more sharper and, and more explicitly with Millie. And look, I think at the end of the day, uh, those became my four additional lines to the one I said I told the Senate. And if the president had asked me to do anything like that, or I should say ordered me to do anything like that, I, I wasn't going to, I was, wasn't about to disobey him or circumvent him or uh, whatever the case may be. But my duty would be to go back to him, make sure I understood the orders clearly, uh, make sure that I offered up al alternatives to him. And if he was still insistent and I still felt it crossed a red line, I would resign. It's that simple. And look, I, as I described in a book, there were a lot of times that I had to go back to him and push back or propose alternatives. And uh, June 1st being a good example, the withdrawal of troops from uh, uh, from Germany being another example where I came up with a, a really clever option that would actually improve our deterrence of Russia. So uh, I had worked my way through this enough to understand where I would stand and how I, I would play this out if I came to those situations. And fortunately, I wasn't placed in that. One of the uh, enduring uh, mystery, mysteries for me, Mr. Secretary, uh, is is what happened after you were fired and uh, Chris Miller came in as Secretary of Defense. The election had passed. Uh, a lot of people uh, wrote at the time that uh, the real power in the Pentagon seemed to be held not so much by Miller, but by his chief of staff, former uh, Trump uh, NSC staffer, uh, Cash Patel. Uh, there were all sorts of uh, rumors and, and seeming uh, beginnings of actions, uh, but exactly what uh, was was being planned at the Pentagon in the period we now know that some around the president were plotting to see if they could maintain his power in office. The, the question for me is what uh, might the Pentagon's role in that have been? And I'm, I'm curious, you, you know the Pentagon and this cast of characters as well as anybody. What's your, what's your best understanding of, of what was happening in those weeks into January uh, towards, uh, towards uh, Inauguration Day after you left? Yeah, much of that remains a big unknown, and I still, you know, I'm curious as well, David. I think to answer your question, folks have to understand a little bit about DOD, its organization and authorities, and 
as I said earlier, I think the only two people that can deploy forces, a military forces, are the president and the secretary of defense. And if the president wants to do it, he does it through the secretary of defense. So the secretary of defense is a key job. It's it's the, there's nobody else that has the authority and powers that, that that person does, which, again, gets back to why I decided to stay and, and, and play defense, if you will. Uh, so, uh, you know, Chris Miller worked in the White House previously. But it was the installation of not just him, but the removal of several of my undersecretaries and key staff that were also replaced by Trump loyalists into these key positions, right? The head of policy, the head of intelligence, the chief of staff, uh, special advisors were, were installed into the, uh, into the Pentagon. And people will say, well, you know, General Milley was there. Yeah, he was. And I was confident Milley would do the right thing. But you got to note the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has no command authority. He is an advisor, an advisor to the Secretary of Defense and to the president. He can't stop anything. Uh, he can't override any commands. And that's that's under law. So, uh, you know, we know from what's been reported that within days, uh, a day or two of my being fired, uh, you know, this team is called to the White House. Um, the president's asking about, you know, conducting strikes against Iran and DOD is supporting it, or at least, um, you know, the acting Secretary of Defense is, if you, if you read the reports. And then we, we see, of course, this precipitous withdrawal from Somalia that President Biden is now reversing. We know that uh, they are still pressing to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan, something that I opposed in the fall and might have contributed to my, my, uh, my removal as well. So we start seeing these, these ideas that, that I was and Millie were able to swat down in the previous months coming back up here at the last moment. And meanwhile, you have DOD undermining the peaceful transition of power to the Biden administration by seemingly refusing to meet with the Biden transition team. So all these things are happening out there. And I think, as you suggest, we, we learned that in late December sometime, uh, the president entertains a meeting in the Oval Office and uh, ideas are put on the table that somehow he might declare martial law or, or the military would seize ballot boxes and, and all those things that were kind of the worst of all of our fears. So I want to close, uh, Mr. Secretary, by asking you about about Ukraine, which is such such a focus of all of our attention. Ask you first about uh, the uh, issues that surrounded President Trump's uh, impeachment. You t told uh, uh, CBS's Nora O'Donnell about how you'd pressed uh, President Trump to release the two hundred fifty million dollars in military aid uh, following his his famous phone call with President Zelensky. Uh, you said it would be an argument after argument. I have to say, Mr. President, at the end of the day, Congress appropriated it. It's the law. We have to do it. Um, we ended up having an impeachment and trial in the Senate on those uh, facts and issues. And I'm curious whether you felt uh, an, an obligation, uh, a concern about, about testifying to what you had experienced, what you'd witnessed. Uh, as somebody who was part of that drama. I know the White House didn't want uh, members of the of the cabinet, the government to testify, but did you think possibly you had an obligation to testify anyway? Well, you know, there never was a trial, right, in the Senate, as I recall. Um, it never got to that point. And uh, in, during the fall, I was asked whether DOD would support the in, impeachment by providing documents. I said on a Sunday news show, we would provide whatever we could. So. Look, I believe in getting to the to the bottom of the truth for accountability, those types of things. But just to rewind a little bit, to be clear, uh, I didn't know that Trump had this phone call with Zelensky on the 25th. Uh, my first day in office is actually the 24th, having been sworn in on the 23rd. And so you're right. It was uh, Bolton, Pompeo and I go back and forth with the president uh, trying to get him to release the aid. And at the same time, behind the scenes, the three of us are asking what's going on. Why won't he relent? And uh, I'm telling my Pentagon staff who's engaging with the OMB and, and others at the White House, hey, keep pressing, keep good notes, because I thought this would be a showdown between the executive branch and the congressional branch, and uh, make sure that you keep pushing the line that the DOD wants this release. So look, I wasn't aware of any of this in, until it hits the newspapers and was quite surprised as anybody else, but then kind of you know connected the dots and figured it out. But uh, look, if it got to uh, an impeachment place and and uh, I was called, subpoenaed to impeach. I, I would have testified. It's that simple. So uh, again, I think in all these things, to include the January 6th committee, we got to learn the truth. We got to find out for purposes of accountability and purpose of, uh, purposes of history, how our government works or doesn't work and who did what or didn't do what, because the American people deserve to know their history.
And it's critical that uh, we learn lessons so that we can prevent things from happening in the future. Last question. Have you testified before the January 6th committee? Yes, I did. I spoke to him uh, once informally and, and a second time formally on the record. Absolutely. So, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for talking about your book, A Sacred Duty. Uh, it is uh, available. It's being widely discussed and for good reasons. It's got a lot of fascinating information. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, David. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. So uh, please join us on Washington Post uh, Live for our other programming. Go, go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Look at what we've got. Register for the programs. We'll see you soon. Thank you.